Can everybody hear me? Yeah, of course. Because um, I'm wired and I have a kind of a very small <laughs> range. <laughs> so <laughs> see if, if I get carried yeah. away, you lose if the sound and you know what happened. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So I have to apologize for my Dutch accent. I can also do this in Dutch with an English accent. <laughs> and today I'm talking about um, Rex and NetRex and the Rex Language Association. The Rex Language Association is in existence since uh, 1990 and we have uh, done 28 yearly symposia now. And unfortunately the number of persons attending is dwindling because uh, it's just like um, a l a lots of older technology um, it is s quietly using it is losing its user base we all get older and um, but for the uh, the people who know it uh, it's always uh, a, a very nice language to program in and um, the result is that I'm always preaching to the choir if I'm speaking about Rex because uh, e either you heard about it and then you're in the Rex presentation or you didn't hear about it and then you're doing something else elsewhere like Swift and Objective-C and uh, other programming languages. So. Um, the official program is um, to tell you a bit about what Rex is, what its history is, what Rex LA does and um, how we turned it into open source for a very large part. The unofficial part is of course the opportunity um, to interact with you and you asking me questions which would be much more interesting uh, I think. Um, I'm one of the persons who was um, an official OS2 systems programmer. It was in my job title at the central bank. I was MVS and OS2 systems programmer. Um, this was during, um, well, that I think the very start of it. I mean, it was the first text-based version that needed to compete to DeskView. Uh, this was before graphics was built in. Um, um, Rex wasn't, uh, like Roderick just said, in the first version of OS2. It was. It wasn't. It wasn't. It wasn't. Be and there's an interesting anecdote going with that. Um, there was a meeting uh, somewhere in the United States. Uh, the Rex book by Mike Orleshaw uh, lay on the table. Mike was present and Bill Gates himself said, this is what not going to go into OS2. Um, um, and this is the reason that it wasn't actually in the first standard edition because in the Microsoft days there was a standard and an extended edition. Rex was in um, OS2 EE 1.1. I mean the first version we could just skip because it was a, a, a graphical program starter uh, which didn't start programs very well by the way. Could print to one type of printer which was an IBM printer uh, in those days. Uh, drivers were always um, one of the less um, realized parts of OS2 and I'm happy to see that companies nowadays are filling in that void uh, after the fact. So it was in uh, the 1.3 um, where the split between standard edition and extended edition uh, went away that IBM uh, IBM did a rewrite in assembler for most of OS2 which was an enormously expensive uh, uh, thing that they planned because the first version was in C, didn't run very well. Uh, 1.3 was assembler uh, written by um, uh, older IBM people, some of them actually learned PC assembler uh, to do this and in my opinion that was the first version that really ran well uh, and it, it ran so well that you could run it into, um, well uh, I think it was in the mega megabytes uh, era still, it ran in 16 megabytes and, and if you fully tricked it out with uh, let's say um, communications manager to go to the mainframe and uh, let's say database manager it would run very well in 64 megs and then um, 
of course Windows NT came along and uh, th that stopped nearly every machine in its tracks. I was part of a joint effort between the central bank and a company called uh, Interpay. It's called Equans now, it's a clearinghouse and we had to build the new generation of a financial workstation and that would be running always too. So um, of course we had the usual problems in deciding which GUI to choose um, uh, at, the, at the very end. I mean we spent the time that deliberating this and in that time we could have written all major GUIs, of course, we could have written a presentation manager, a Windows uh, version, an X Windows version. Uh, it was decided we would use Zinc as a cross platform uh, a GUI library. And Zinc uh, had its own set of problems, one of them being that the vendors of Zinc didn't really understand anything about DLL initialization. So we had terrible problems with that, that the problems, um, we requested the source, we couldn't get it, then we fixed the problem and then Zinc requested our fix and they couldn't get it either. <laughs> <laughs> so this was, um, it was an interesting time uh, and um, OS2 wasn't always as rock solid as it is now and I remember that during the last part of the project we had the daily builds those were nightly builds, uh, we had them beeped over from America and we had hired one of the security guys to install it in the morning before we came in. So we would run on the new version of OS2 which had less bugs than the, the, old, the older version that was only one day old. Um, unfortunately the project was uh, cancelled at the last moment because like um, most of those projects in those days the hardware was ordered at the start of the project and I think it was um, it was a PS2 model 70 don't know if anyone remembers those uh, with um, not enough memory in it for the final system so um, there was a panic of course and I remember uh, I remember vividly spending a whole week to page tune all the executables because there was a utility and I forgot its name. I did however find back the suitcase I had in those days <laughs> in the storage and I also brought some of the relics of that time which is the OS2 Rex from Bark to Byte book. I think we, I, I don't know if it's in PDF, otherwise I will have it scanned and will donate it to, uh, to Warpstock. I also have the, have the OS2 2.0 technical library uh, Rex book. So OS2 came with an enormous amount of documentation, it was like this. And I remember uh, being an OS2 systems programmer, not being allowed to read those books because they belong to another department of the central bank. <laughs> so I would have to sneak in at night and um, for a number of days that stack of books just <laughs> went smaller and smaller because I, all, I, I nicked them all and brought them home and I still have them all. It was not really a crime because the people who had that series of books didn't understand about APIs or linkage conventions or DLL imports anyway. So I don't think it's uh, it's it's not a bad thing that I confess to this now. I work at another place, by the way. <laughs> so. Um, and of course, after having page tuned all those executables, it ran like a dream. It was actually very fast. Uh, still don't remember. Anybody remember the name of that utility? Because I mean, we had to note the sequence in which the page were uh, pages were loaded, and then we could tell the linkage editor to actually write out the executables in that order, which made an enormous difference. And of course, the um, we celebrate this, this with champagne, only some of my managers forgot to tell the directors of the bank in Interpay and the project was cancelled at the cost of 50 million guilders then, because we didn't have euros then. And that was only the part they could prove, because actually it's, it would have been much more expensive. So, what is Rex? Um, it, uh, I don't have to tell you, you all use Rex and um, so did we start 
our Rex history on the mainframe. People are here, VMCMS people over here. Are there MVSTSO people? Okay, excellent. You're the only one apparently, less people than I thought, because I thought, well, the OS people, OS2 people are from blue shops, and I mean, IBM first told you to run a mainframe, and then they told you to run PCs with OS2, and then they told you to run AIX. Fortunately, all of them have Rex as a scripting language. Um, it was an interpreter first for very uh, many years. It was, um, well, let me not tell all my slides in advance. The most important part of it is that it's uh, meant to be easy for the human user and not for the person implementing the language translator. Because you see lots of languages that has, have semicolons at a fixed place because of, then you can scan the line at once and you have very many programming languages that give you 850 syntax error messages if you forget one of those uh, and, and Pascal is one of the horrible examples of how you can forget only one thing and then have pages and pages of, uh, of error messages. I remember having to deliver Pascal uh, in punch cards at university and then receiving back my error reports which were like this. Rex is, is um, the scoping is different so you only get one message and you can actually put a pointer on in the on the offending position and that's only one of the good things. So um, one of um, the um, technological advancement that made that possible is that it was the um, beginning of the network area um, era. IBM had VNet and um, all of the first Rex users were connected by VNet and that made it possible to um, implement Rex in a uh, an entirely different way because um, actually first the specifications were mailed around to everyone and then everybody could have um, comments and advisories on that and then the actually the actual implementation took place so uh, actually it, it's th this inspired the, the the human aspect of the Rex language uh, of course it's not one language anymore I mean the, the moment you build the second interpreter you uh, have have slight differences of course and you can try to hide them into footnotes in the manual but if you go to different machine types and if you go to different character sets then there are bound to be differences and so Rex actually is a um, family of languages nowadays uh, of which you can say the granddaddy is the VM CMS implementation, which is leaning a lot on VM constructs like uh, queues and stacks. Uh, those we didn't have at the TSO. I met Rex myself around 1989, 1990, when uh, I was an MVS systems programmer and in TSO extensions too. I never forget the day there was this thing called Rex and you could make your own small programs and, and it didn't look <coughs> at all like C-List. Anybody re uses or remembers C-List? Um, it's another kind of scripting language. Probably, 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 I'm, I'm probably I'm much too old for this. Um. So a scripting language is a, 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 a kind of a glue language that can control several applications and I think that's still um, where Rex is used the most and um, sometimes you can't sleep and you think about how does it come that Rex isn't wi widely popular like uh, let's say uh, Java or C sharp or to, to, to mention another dirty word and one of the reasons is most of the Rex I encounter because I'm, I'm, I'm still an active mainframe consultant uh, at least part of my time is because Nearly every important application or glue within applications is written under the radar by some systems person who is actually not allowed to program applications. But you know, it didn't run and we like to try to help out and well, you can have this piece of script but you can't tell anyone and I mean if we took cracks away then the whole world would collapse because all the, the credit cards and the funds transfers and, and the payment systems they would all fall over because 
Uh, apparently they are all in Kix Global DB2. Uh, CICS for the English speakers, uh, six for the German speakers. And uh, in reality, uh, lots of that code is, is Rex, written by old guys sometimes with sandals and long hair, beards. Um, so it's, a, it's an under the radar language, it's not known to management and um, so you encounter it at your job and you say, wow, is this also Rex? This, I mean, this is an important credit card company. So this, this part of the macking and the encryption is written in Rex. Wow, you go like that. And there's, of course, a lot of people from India who email you or call you in the middle of the night and says, yes, I forgot the question about Rex. How do you do this and this? So it is alive, but it's not like everybody is trying to be part of the NetRex Language Association because I mean most of the Indian people just see it as work well you get this mainframe application it, it came from Europe or it came from the States now we have to do it and what's this thing ah it's called Rex okay great so early scripting languages um, and Rex is one of the earliest of the scripting languages we had um, Tickle uh, I think a few years before Rex um, uh, we had Perl uh, a few years after Rex. We actually had Larry Wall, who was uh, working at NSA then, uh, at one of the earliest Rex symposia. Uh, in very, he was very brave because we still had Rex symposia of 200, 250 people then. It's now more like 15 or 20. And we, yeah, I would be really, really happy if I had a room like this like Warpstock uh, for the Rex LA uh, language conference. Larry Wall, who single-handedly uh, told us that Rex is a bad language, he was writing a better language, it's called Perl. Mm -hmm. And we know how that ended. Actually, much more successful than Rex in numbers of installation and actually in readability of code, uh, way worse than Rex because I, I, I mean if I have to maintain some piece of Perl somewhere I just see what it does and write a new one because it's really a write-only language uh, in my opinion compared to Rex. So how did it come about? 1979, Mike Corlishaw, he was working at uh, IBM's Hersleaf uh, factory, actually in the department that made those nice color terminals that were extremely expensive, had very nice blue colors and reddish and they, they had clickers under the keyboard, so if you, I mean this was before the, the System M keyboards that I associate with those two. We had clickers in the keyboards and he saw a language which was called EXEC2 in VM and it existed mostly of ampersand and he tried to make um, something like PL1 but then simple and as an interpreter and not the compiler. PL1 has a separate history and very uh, lots, lots of nice anecdotes but it's for another time. So actually Rex is an attempt to do a very small PL1. Uh, the PL1 one of the PL1 compilers actually came out of Hursley uh, in those days so I think some of the inspiration was gleaned from its source code and it was called Rex with one X and then the IBM law department said, well, you can't have it because there's another uh, a product, it's called Rex, uh, nobody sells it and it's probably dead, but we can't run the risk. So they spent a million dollars in uh, adding that extra X and the backronym then was invented. A uh, backronym is of course something that is after the fact established as the restructured extended executor. Exec2 was its uh, was its daddy, and uh, the thing is, um, it came out more or less at the same time. I mean, you had one VM release that says, "Oh, we have a scripting language now. It's called Exec2," and then the next decimal release of VM said, "But the scripting language was no good, and we now we now have Rex." Mike was uh, actually fired uh, first, uh, then rehired and reprimanded. And uh, like large um, 
bureaucratic organizations like IBM and the Soviet Union, you know, the guy, the Russian guy who saved all our lives by not pushing the nuclear button in. He was, he was put in jail and then he got a medal and so Mike was f fired first and then he was made an IBM fellow, which is the highest honor you can have as an IBMer, which means you can actually do, do anything you want and actually have a team of people to <coughs> do what you want and stuff. Uh, when we get to networks, this is an important uh, detail. So, exec2 was made out of ampersand. And the, 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 the brilliant thing Mike thought of was to turn that around, uh, let it have PL1 based syntax. And um, things he deemed important at that time, uh, which are actually important because um, um, Hursley made one of the first uh, decimal computers. I mean, later computers were binary. The first ones were decimal, and the thing with binary computers is you always get wrong answers, more or less. I mean, if you get rounding errors and your floating points are no good. So he put in unlimited precision arithmetic, which is still one of the reasons that if you have financial applications, it's very good to use REC for that. Uh, this was purely software-based uh, decimal arithmetic and that meant of course that if you have large precisions you can have uh, unlimited precisions but not really unlimited because sometimes your memory is gone and other times it just takes too long to compute it all certainly in the processes that we have in those days um, debugging uh, has the par um, is, has a trace tool and the trace tool is very important because it automates your print statements. And as probably everyone knows, um, full screen debugging is nice and uh, it, it looks very interesting. And if you have a setup in which you can debug something on your own machine running on the own time, it's, it's an interesting concept. But most debugging of server and nowadays cloud programming is done by print statements. So trace is a way to um, automate your print statements. Uh, which is a nice form of debugging. A parsing has a parse statement, which is nothing like regular expressions. It's template based. You probably all know this. And um, because PL1 was such an enormous language, I mean, nobody can really learn PL1 because I mean, the, the, the stack of books is wider than OS2 stack of books, and it's only the only the one language. So keeping the language small was one of the important goals in the beginning. And everything is a string, so all numbers are strings also. So you in classic Rex, which is the oldest part of the family of Rex languages, you only have one data type, which is string. So VMNet, I told you about first document, then implement. Um, there are actually two uh, people who have the honor of being the first Rex user. One of them is Les Geuler. He is secretary of the Language Association and the other one is Ray Mansell and I, I don't know him. But th these are the people who first used that tape that Mike sent around. So 79 uh, it was started. Actually Mike was waiting on delivery of uh, an Acorn a chipset kit, but that delivery was late, and this is why he decided to use his time uh, in writing this interpreter. The important conclusion is that if Acorn did deliver that uh, the prototype kit in a timely way, we probably never would have had uh, Rex, and history would have looked different, at least for me. So, um, in 83, it was an official part of uh, VM, the mainframe uh, operating system. If you speak to younger people, they say, uh, you mean VMware? No, no, there was another VM before VMware, and this was IBM's mainframe, I think. And um, 89 TSO, and for this meeting, very relevant, 1990, it was on extended edition OS2, because Microsoft couldn't win this all. I mean, the extended part was the thing that had all IBM's tools in it, like um, uh, SNA communication to connect to VTEM, uh, DB2, and uh, there were some other things, probably. There was a very nice um, 
ISPF-like user interface kit, which was later donated to Microfocus, I think. And um, this is probably not readable, but it's the first Rex reference summary with 1x uh, still. Because we used to have, I mean, if you asked another systems programmer for his green, green card, then you didn't mean uh, his residence status, you did mean his uh, card that had the uh, mainframe instruction set on it and your hex to EPSIDIC uh, tables and things. So this uh, it looks a bit yellowish, but this was Rex's uh, first green card. So, um, now other people got the news and started to implement interpreters. Um, Rex didn't get two PC DOS. Uh, this was be because Hursley didn't get budget for a PC. And the task of writing PC, because Rex was meant to be in the, the in 81 in the first IBM PC. Uh, this went wrong because um, I think Santa Teresa Labs got the assignment and the important uh, PC prototype and they didn't deliver Rex in time. It was a few months difference, but for IBM that's enough. Well, okay, no, no, we, we didn't have it. So, and actually it took till DOS 7, I think, to, to include Rex. And I never saw that, so if someone has a DOS 7 around then... Is it actually, is it in um, the, the DOS that is in um, Ecom Station or Arco OS? Does anybody know? No. It's not. No. It's not. I think PC DOS 7. You've got it? Yeah. Okay, great. So you can use Rex. You can copy the disk and have them somewhere. Uh, for historical purposes of Rex Language five, Association. One of the five languages that puts directly online from computer. Ah, that's excellent. So there are two things that won't run on the internal DOS. A very few, but I've got one that won't, so I run on 622, you know, MS DOS. Mm -hmm. But one does what one must. Yes. And one keeps everything that ever uh, happened uh, safely on CDs and uh, in the cloud now. So other people started to write um, Rex interpreters. One of the first was Mansfield Rex, uh, which was a product, you could buy it and then you would have Rex on DOS. Um, another interesting thing is uh, A-Rex for the Commodore Amiga, because IBM liked some of IBM was in that time already with Microsoft and thinking about graphical user interfaces. They liked the stuff on the Amiga. A anybody had an Amiga? <laughs> Yeah, okay, great. So they liked it and they swapped some Amiga technology for the Rex interpreter source code. So this is how Amiga got, uh, the Commodore Amiga got uh, A-Rex. People I speak about it are very enthusiastic about the Amiga and it's just, it's just like, like us with OS2 and oh, if, we, if, if people were wiser and we still would have Amiga or OS2 or like that. So, and then the, the, it, it broke loose, of course, then we, we got Tandem non-stop, we've got different forms of Unix, AIX, got an official IBM Rex version uh, from Endicott Labs. Um, 92, those were the first open source-like uh, implementations. Uh, Regina, because it's from Scandinavia. And uh, Rex IMC is from a guy called Ian in England. Um, which is good. Regina, you can still run, I think, it on the most extensive set of, of I mean, if, if you find the platform somewhere, you can probably find the Regina to compile on it. it uh, you, you do a configure, you do a make, and it, it will probably run. It's um, maintained in Australia by Mark Hessling. So, and when all those interpreters came up and people needed to speak to each other, um, the Rex Language Association Symposium was organized, and this was first for compiler and interpreter writers first. Uh, IBM was working on the compiler then, uh, started out in hi in Israel and was completed actually in, well, have to be uh, people from Austria here, because if you, 
if, if, if you tell to the Austrian labs people that it was completed in uh, Vienna, then they all are very mad at you and they say, no, we scrapped the stuff from Israel and we wrote a whole new thing. And so actually the compiler was the compiler is running on uh, VM, CMS and TSO. That's actually the only IBM product that still runs a, a nice profit. Uh, except for OS2 and the ARCA um, <laughs> licenses now, I think. I never, I never, I don't know if 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 OS2 ever came into the black because I mean I know an enormous amount of people worked on it uh, for years and years and years, and I don't know if it ever. But in any case, the, the compiler does still um, earn a lot of money for IBM. And in 1919, all the first uh, implementers and compiler writers met and said, well, this is a good idea, let's do that every year. Um, and that's also the beginning of the Rex Language Association. So uh, Rex was standardized as an official um, an anti-language, which anti became ISO, I think, and ISO became something else. But it's standardized, I mean, it's just like Fortran and COBOL and uh, other um, ADA, all, all, all the kinds of languages that have an official international standard. And you have to look very hard to find one of the interpreters that actually it, it meets that standard. <laughs> Regina is coming closest because Regina has stuff like address width built into it. It also has the stream I.O. functions that didn't make the mainframe version ever because they were a few days late and the source code repository at Endicott was closed at a certain date and Mike said, oh, but I have this stream I.O. and I said, no. So that never, I think um, ZOS or ZOS if you want, 2.2 actually includes those things, but IBM never told anyone so. But and I, I mistakenly uploaded one of my PC programs and ran it and then I thought, hey, it's, it's working. But you can't count on it because it's not installed and you know how mainframes are. You want to use a certain function and you have to go to the systems guy and he said, no, it's not allowed. Uh, and then there you go. So, 89, we had the compiler. Uh, the compiler is actually a very nifty thing because the um, human-oriented syntax uh, that makes Rex such a pleasure to use, makes it actually very hard to write a compiler. And uh, people have gone slightly mad over that, but uh, in the end they, they, they've just fixed it and it, it runs. So that gives you performance improvements, mainly for things that are arithmetic and internal to the language. Unfortunately, Rex is used a lot to call external things. Well, that's not that fast if you call the compiler. I mean, you, you, have, to do, you have to do more things actually in compile code. So if you are just using it as glue, then you might as well just interpret it. The other thing is, um, if you sell an application and you don't want people to have the source, then you could compile it and it wouldn't be recognizable. Um, at a certain point in our history, uh, object orientation came into play. Um, so there were committees that uh, tried to decide on how Rex should be object oriented also. Um, th there's a bit of a generation gap here. Uh, there are a lot of mainframe people who never want to use object oriented at all. And there are the younger people that don't know what object oriented is because it, it was there when they went to school and they, well, this is how you do it. And actually, in, in Rex, the difference between object Rex and classic Rex is not that great. I mean, you, you call a function and you specify what to do it on. And in object Rex, you say what to do it on dot call the function and leave the other thing out. I mean, that's the big thing. And that, that one simple change uh, led to uh, a whole different way of programming in which you can keep your code and data into, uh, well, you know about object orientation. And if you don't, you probably won't like it ever. So um, the important thing about object tracks is it's not done by Mike Collishaw. And um, I think he kept quiet too long about things he didn't like uh, about it. Uh, it's got uh, punctuation things like uh, t uh, t tildes, twiddles, 
and it's got things with uh, double columns in it and those are the things that probably he didn't like from the beginning but he didn't want to offend Simon Nash who he was, he was down the hall from him and uh, the important thing is in OS2 you have both uh, I don't know how it's done now but as I remember and I'm from pre-warp uh, for my main OS2 activity uh, you would get a switch rex command in which you could say well now I've got object rex also and it would be entirely compatible with classical rex with one big difference because the classic rex just parses line by line just draws in a line looks at it and executes it if you have some syntax error in a part of your program that you don't use you can't run it under object tracks because that tries to parse your own program and says well sorry line number such and such which you didn't know you would never hit has an error in it that's the difference um, it wasn't a big commercial success because um, uh, Rex was gone into I mean the, the if you if you look at Google Trends at older versions of Google Trends, you see Rex peak in about 1995. Because everybody was talking about it, everybody was talking about the OO version of it, uh, there was talk about IBM open sourcing it, there was talk about uh, having Linux versions. Uh, that, that all took a number of years and uh, IBM changed. Um, it was, for example, the, the acquisition of Lotus that, that made Rex a bit of a second-class citizen in those days. And um, the important thing was that the development laboratory was moved from Endicott, where all the people were who just made the product, was moved to, to Böbling in Germany, without any of the people working on the interpreter. So that was, that was, that was a really bad move. Uh, for continuity because I mean the German people are very good they still are working on other projects but they needed a year a year and a half to just get acquainted to the code base uh, actually calling in people from Rex LA to tell them well we've got this this thing from Endicott what is it so um, then it was decided to uh, put it into OS2, but sell it for Windows. And there were, I don't know if anybody bought those, there was a CD with only the interpreter and a CD with the development edition, which had a kind of uh, a precursor of Eclipse. And it had a resource construction kit and you could make uh, presentation manager programs with it and stuff. Never sold very well and it, it uh, actually died off a bit uh, during those days. Um, 2004 uh, um, I heard that IBM was actually going to discontinue all development on it and we asked nicely if we could have it so that we could keep on developing it for uh, other platforms. Now the thing with OS2 of course is, OS2 was another code base. It's owned by the, what's left of the OS2 team in the, the, the icing department. Um, it's got lots of stuff from other people in, it's just the same story as OS2. Uh, the OS2 racks never can be open source because nobody knows which part of it are Microsoft and other companies, which part of it are Amiga. <laughs> We just don't know. So what we inherited from IBM as Rex Language Association is the source code to the Linux, Windows and AIX version, uh, which we still maintain. We added uh, Mac OS X, um, actually it was born on this machine, a version on it and um, there um, is a Linux for the mainframe version of it now. It was a number of times it was rewritten, uh, actually by the retired IBMers who developed it from Endicott, Rick McGuire, uh, and, and his team. So it was actually maintained by IBMers outside of IBM. Uh, the good thing is you can download the source code, build it yourself on your machine, uh, uh, see how it works. Uh, fix some bugs for us which which would be good because um, we are not commercial so it's uh, it's um, it's an activity that has an important negative income actually so if people would like to help out and 
correct some documentation. And the documentation is the professional IBM documentation, so we've got a stack of books. I mean, if you would print them, which nobody does anymore nowadays, but they're all PDF, they're very nice. And also the interpreter. OO Rex has had some problems from the beginning. Um, I don't know if any of you used it to do a lot of I.O. during the day and noticed that it got a bit slower then. That was because of um, memory management issues that uh, were in it from the beginning. I think we, we nearly have them all now, but we took our time. Um, now remember I told you about, uh, and tell me how I'm doing for time, because um, I can abruptly end it or we can just go on, uh, I can just talk forever. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> we're getting close to a lunch break actually. That's good. So, I need two minutes until it's 12 o'clock. The other Rex that we have now is NetRex which is a thing that Mike Collishaw did while he was IBM fellow. He said, wouldn't it be great to have Java on IBM's platforms? Because we had articles in the Financial Times that says, IBM has five different platforms and enormous cost to develop things and they should focus on one thing. Well, they saw Sun's Java. Um, Mike and a friend of his actually were the first people who ported it within IBM uh, to uh, OS2. That was the first Java port in IBM. And then he thought, well, what would happen if I would try to, because nobody likes the syntax of Java. Even James Gosling doesn't do it, like it. He told me himself, he said, well, we were a company that sold C++ compilers. I was trying, um, he did first the bytecode part, because he just had ported six UCSD Pascal things to different internal architectures, so he did the bytecode from Java. He was designing his high-level language, which would look a bit like a scheme or small talk, and then his management said, no, 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 it has to be C++. This, of course, didn't happen once, because when uh, people at um, the browser company Netscape were developing JavaScript, it was just, it, it needed to look like Java. It was also meant to have another syntax, more human oriented and things. So this accident happened twice in our history. So NetRex is a form of Rex, which is not entirely compatible with classic or object, but close enough. I mean, if you know your string functions and your other things, you would be very, very at ease in programming NetRex. But it compiles to Java classes. And since the turn of the century, it doesn't only compile, it also interprets, because for a lot, a lot of things you don't, I mean, you just want to change it and then run it. And then if it's glue or it starts something and gets the output, then you would just interpret it. So it's a translator because it's a compiler and um, an interpreter. So Rex is a bit uh, over its top, but it's still used widely, wild, widely and wildly probably also. Um, classic Rex is still, the, I mean, there's no real other choice on the mainframe, so if you have to do mainframe like lots of Indian people, you need to do Rex and there's not, nobody helps you. Open source, um, well, life has just begun because b both of the implementations, uh, NetRex is open source in 2011. So both of the IBM implementations are now free and open source. You can download them from SourceForge. One is a Git, the other is a Subversion uh, repository, and you can build it yourself. For NetRex, um, you only need um, and NetRex, I, I'm not going to repeat the things that are the same, like um, arbitrary numeric precision and things. Uh, it's got trace. You can use the parse statement to do things like, like Lisp. You have the same trace. You can, uh, the, the interesting thing is you can use, for example, um, all Java libraries to make GUIs like Swing, JavaFX, and if you analyze the things, uh, it turns out you need uh, more or less of 40% of all your typing to do the same thing in NetRex as you do in Java. So it's organized like an interpreter now, but it can compile to Java classes. 
and uh, you can use it in a kind of a scripting mode which means you don't have to define classes with methods in it you can just put the statements under it the translator will recognize that and translate it into Java that does have classes and methods and uh, all the things that the Java compiler needs to compile it's a very small addition uh, it's, it's about uh, 45k uh, in addition to your Java installation and you, then you can run NetRest programs of course the translator itself is a bit uh, larger you can use everything that's in Java so if you want to have grammars in Antler or um, any Java library is just transparently callable from Netrex code. You don't have to define it or it, it, it will find it, it will link it, it will do it. The interpreter we told you about. Um, it has some things uh, like uh, Java. Java has single inheritance and it's a bit of a static language. Uh, object Rex is totally dynamic. In Object Rex, you can say, give me an object and I'll define some methods on it and then run them. Uh, that's a bit harder because of the Java VM structure to do that in NetRex. Um, NetRex was born on OS2 as an OS2 Rex program. So it was first a Rex program that put out Java commands and then the Java commands formed the compiler that could compile the NetRex language as defined, so it was bootstrapped. So NetRex is now written in NetRex, which makes it easy because I always deliver the last version with the source code, because you need the compiler to compile itself. There, it makes for an interesting type of error in which you blow the language so that the old compiler doesn't work anymore either. So then you have to you have to always safe keep one, and we do that in version management, so don't worry. It's bootstrapped. Every major language is bootstrapped, of course. And um, we did open source it. That took years. Uh, that took me years of my life. It, it is then that the gray hair started to appear like here. Because if you speak to IBM um, legal department, those are a different kind of people. And then if you think after one and a half year, you have explained everything, they say, oh, by the way, this is my last week at IBM. You'll get this new guy. And then, <laughs> then the new guy goes like, oh, it's a program language. It's something like PLS. Oh, it can't be open source. So you have to start all and all over again. So that took from 2007 to 2011. Um, this is still the book to have. You can still order reprints from Amazon. And you um, are at the end of this um, presentation with some URLs, um, if you're interested. Um, I can have, it if, if the um, demonstration effect doesn't uh, hinder me, I can do a quick compile on Ecom station, uh, which I have to move to the other window, of course. Uh, maybe I have to tell it to mirror my displays. Because I'm still running OS2 on my Mac, it's just because, I mean, Rex was born on OS2, and I think it's just a token of respect that we just make sure that it still runs um, in every version that we bring out. So let me... Yes. So, we just built a new NetRex, and then in... I have to capture the mouse pointer, of course. Let's say we would like to compile something under OS2. We have an editor, and then we do say hello world stock. Summation mark. Always important not to make too many syntax errors. So we save it. We exit. And then we compile it, and you say hello, and uh, NetRex compile, very quickly, OS2 is a very, I mean, it's it's running on the virtual box now, but it's so much faster than everything that you run natively on those machines. So then we could say Java, hello, and then that's the result of our, um, I mean, it was a Rex program. 
I mean, you know that it looked like a Rex program, but it is a Java, Java class uh, now because it produced a Java source. It called the Java compiler, and it made an executable Java class uh, for you. So I think I'll leave it at that by the time. If there are any quick questions, uh, then probably we can. Yes, the go ahead. Uh, is there somewhere that has kind of a, a listing of differences between Rex and the NetRex? Like I started to create a, I, I took a Rex program that I had, and I was going to try to run through the, you know, seeing if there was some movement on the NetRex. I started to try to, you know, file it over, and it didn't like the date function, mm -hmm. for instance. Yeah, because, well, the question was uh, for the people, I think, online, is is there any good list, good usable list of differences between NetRex and Rex? And I would say, well, there's excellent NetRex documentation, and uh, I think you can see from the differences what the differences are. My advice always is not to try to recompile two large programs, but uh, very small programs, because for date uh, there is no NetRex implementation, because it was decided that Java did enough with dates, so you should use um, Java's date. Now there is, and that's the good news, there is a compatibility package now, which has the date versions like, like uh, Rex uh, uses them. They will be part of some future release of the NetRex compiler. So. Um, to answer your question, well, we're very sorry, and no, there is not a complete list, but we do try to fix non-obvious defects like this. Okay, well, thank you very much. And other, and other questions we'll just do uh, during the break.